Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Carolyn Kassan, and I am an academic director at the Center for Global Affairs at NYU, and I also serve as the director of the recently launched um, Energy, Climate Justice, and Sustainability Lab, and uh, delighted to have, uh, to have you all joining us today for what will be a very, very special presentation. Um, I'm also really delighted to share that the um, Energy, Climate Justice and Sustainability Lab is going to be doing more events with Brookhaven National Lab and um, we'll have an ongoing partnership. And this is just the beginning of a, a really important partnership um, and relationship. And what we hope to do is to, you know, really share with, with um, with our audience, with our community, the really important work that Brookhaven National Lab does um, and to connect it with environmental justice. And this is Climate Week, and I know probably many of you are attending various events. Um, today, what we're, we're highlighting is um, using science and education for environmental justice and looking at community science research work at Brookhaven National Lab. And we are just thrilled, delighted, and honored to have two fantastic scientists from Brookhaven joining us, joining us today, who will be presenting. There will also be time for questions. So, um, so if you have questions, do share them in the Q&A and uh, we'll make sure that we, uh, we answer them. So who do we have joining us today? We have Dr. Um, Alita Perez, who is the Supervisor, Student Research and Citizen Science, emphasis on Citizen Science, Office of Educational Programs. And Dr. Perez has a BS in Biology from the University of Puerto Rico and a PhD in Microbiology and Immunology from the University of Michigan. And she has a strong background in virology and molecular biology research. Very, very, very impressive, Dr. Perez. We're also joined by Dr. Uh, Lisa Miller, who is biophy biophysicist chemist um, in the, and the manager of the User Services Communications Education and Out Outreach Office um, at the everyone listening, at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Um, and Dr. Miller has her, um, has her BS in chemistry from John Carroll University. She has her uh, master's in chemistry from Georgetown, and she has a PhD in biophysics from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And I, I'm very intentionally emphasizing their educational background because um, you know, I really want to encourage young people to, uh, to pursue science. And I think we have two, these, you know, two scientists joining us today are really wonderful examples of the important work that can be done through a career in, in science. So I'm gonna hand it over to, um, uh, to Alida and to Lisa, but thank you both so much for joining us. And thank you for the really incredible work that you're doing and to bring citizen science um, to the communities you work with and the incredible work that happens at Brookhaven National Lab. So thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for the very kind work. Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, you can see that. I hope you can see the slides. Yeah. All right, so thank you, uh, Carolyn. Uh, as Carolyn mentioned, my name is Alida Perez, and I am joined by my colleague and collaborator, uh, Lisa Miller, uh, they're both from Brookhaven Lab. And today we will be presenting uh, to the audience various programs that we have uh, to engage our students and our educators and community at Brookhaven Lab, you know, growing the STEM pipeline, uh, as, as the title says. Um, why should we care? Why this is important to, to, to us is because it's important to develop an inclusive and diverse uh, STEM workforce that is, is really ready to, to answer um, our most challenging climate uh, change problems. So climate change affects all of us, uh, but does not affect all of us in the same way when we think about the underserved as the underrepresented communities. So um, in order to, to get things going, 
Um, I'm going to start first uh, giving you a little bit of information about Brookhaven Lab. So uh, if you probably, most of us, uh, most of people in the audience have not been to Brookhaven. I just wanted to let you know that this is a photo of Brookhaven. We are at the east end of Long Island as we go, you know, driving to the west of the Hampton region. We're surrounded here by the Pine Barrens. And we are a town, we are up in New York. So if you look in the map of Long Island and you see up in New York, that's Brookhaven map. Um, as you can see here in this very nice image, um, area view, we are a complex, we are a city of science. We have many research labs, we have many facilities uh, that collaborate and work together um, in various uh, scientific endeavors, you know, whether it's physics, whether it's chemistry, uh, basic science research that is done at the laboratory including um, climate science and environmental science. But the Brookhaven National Laboratory is not the only national lab. They, we are part of the Department of Energy family of, 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 um, of national laboratories. There's 17 national laboratories all around the United States. Um, as you can see, we are kind of almost everywhere um, across the, 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 the country. Uh, you probably have heard of Los Alamos National Lab, which is right here. If you have heard the Manhattan Project, you probably heard of, Na of, of Los Alamos National Laboratory. And each of these laboratories have the facilities, instruments, and each of them has their own mission. Uh, but the beauty of, 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 of being part of a larger group or a larger family is that we can collaborate and work together as teams uh, to solve uh, the critical scientific challenges in, in, in climate science being one of them. So in the, in the next set of slides, I just wanna share with you an example of some of that collaborative work that is done across the national laboratories. Uh, so uh, here I wanna, in, in like, and like Carolyn mentioned, this is the first uh, presentation of a series of presentations. So you probably will hear more about these projects. Um, in future talks. But like I said, I just wanted to give you a sense of what the climate research uh, science is done at Brookhaven Lab and that this is a collaborative effort with other institutions. So here, I just wanna share with you the Tracer project. Um, this project is led by uh, Mike Jensen, which is right here at Brookhaven Lab. He's a fabulous mentor, by the way. And he is collaborating with others at Los Alamos National Laboratory and the University of Houston as well. And the cool thing about this project that I really think is very cool and nice is that they have um, this kind of unit and they are putting these units in different par parts of the Houston, Texas region. And what they're trying to do is collect data, you know, aerosols, these particles that you find in the atmosphere and, um, and see how these particles that you find in the atmosphere affect in, uh, affect in this case, cloud formation. Okay. And the cloud formation, in particular, these clouds here, that this convective cloud, these are the clouds that you see in storms that give you lots of rain and it gives you lots of lightning. So they lighting. So they want to study what is the effect of these aerosols in this cloud formation. So it's a it's a it's a very cool project. Um, the Tracer project has also given opportunities to high school students and college students. Uh, to participate and to be part of the process for analyzing data and understanding what's going on. This is an ongoing mission, by the way. It's a year long and it's about to kick off quite soon. Um, soon. Uh, the second project that I want to show that you also very, I like it, I think it's also very, very fascinating. It's the, it's the predicting urban uh, coastal microclimate. This is the image of the group right here. Um, this is a collaboration with Sunny Brook University. And, um, and the cool thing is that this have this little mobile lab right here. And they can take that mobile lab and move it to, air, to urban, urban and coastal areas, areas that are not easily accessible by other tools. And they can collect data. They can collect data about the weather, the temperature, and so, so forth. But what the, the cool thing about this is that it, it, it provides information to improve forecasting. So you can better manage, for example, energy resources in energy resources in those areas or national disaster preparation, you know, as you can see now in the news in how uh, very urban and coastal areas have been affected uh, by 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 very like by, by rapid uh, uh, weather changes. Um, 
So again, these are opportunities that uh, these programs are given a platform for students to be part of, uh, engage and be part of the conversation. Okay. So I just wanna jump very quickly or jump into the Office of Educational Programs at Brookhaven Lab. And I wanna introduce a little bit about who we are. Um, as I mentioned, the, the mission for us for the, the, the education of programs is to develop this inclusive and diverse workforce that is ready, like I said in the beginning, to answer most, uh, most challenging problems, you know, challenging problems. And it's important because these problems, if you're talking about climate change and, climate and environmental issues, affects all of us, but it does not affect everybody in the same way. So by creating this diverse pool and this diverse and inclusive work pool, it brings uh, different perspectives and it brings different uh, uh, um, opinions and perspectives, okay? We have programs all the way from the college, from, college, from um, element, for elementary all the way to college and post-college, uh, for uh, uh, college and graduate level. So by, by by doing this, we provide programs that provide the students authentic research experiences in addressing these issues. And these programs that we offer or we have are collaborative. So they're collaborative because the collaborative between Brookhaven Lab and our partners. The programs that we have at our Office of Educational Programs connect students and educators with a expert and, and a scientific expertise in the environmental and climate issues. And it provides our students opportunity to contribute if be part of the, of the conversation. So what I'm gonna do now is in the next set of slides that we have prepared is to give you, is to present to you some of those programs um, that uh, we have at the office that have uh, provided students a platform or a way to engage in environmental uh, conversation and issue. The very first program that I want to share with you is probably one of my favorite programs. It's a, a program that is truly dearest to my heart, and it's the STEM Prep Summer Institute here at Brookhaven Lab. Um, this is the program, and I just thought first I'm going to go through some logistics in here. It's a program that is a four-week program at, 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 at Brookhaven Lab that is for uh, students that are underrepresented and underserved communities uh, that have completed the ninth grade. Um, we, we break up in various topics. One of the topics that we covered is an environmental week. And during that environmental week, we introduce students to Long Island ecosystem. So they, this is an opportunity for students that usually live within the, live in areas of the island. They have not quite aware of what is around their community. So we engage them into this exploration on the Long Island ecosystem by, you know, by either we have done walks through the Comstock State Park. And most recently, we have taken our students into a boat, uh, a scientific boat expedition uh, in, uh, in the south shore of Long Island. And these are the images that I have here, okay? And so through that experiences, they, you know, they get to do biological and clinical surveys. So they get to uh, have a, an introduction to authentic research environments. Like you can see here, there, and, and this image and this image, they are looking and counting um, the um, marine, um, the marine component, the fishes and, and the marine composition of the water. Actually, for this particular uh, uh, experiment, we went out and, and to look for sea worms. So our goal was to collect sea worms so we can then not just do a, a, a count of them, but do a genetic analysis of them. Um, we introduced them to chemical uh, tools for chemical analysis. But one of the cool things about the, the STEM prep that we introduced our students is that um, we did expose, expose them to instrumentation that is not really available to the school. So one thing that we did was we used a remote operating vehicle here, an ROV, and you have these students operating this ROV, and they're able to submerge this uh, remote operating vehicle and really explore uh, the, the, envi the, the, the environment um, in the waters, the, on, on the water environment of this shore. And if exposed them to, to experts in the field, like Buzz here, um, he is um, an explorer and um, he um, 
provide this expertise to the students and how to utilize these tools, okay? So early exposure is important. It allows the, the students, particularly students who are of underserved and underrepresented communities to think about themselves as part, as, 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 as part of these fields, particularly in the environmental science field. So the STEM purpose are one of the programs that we start with, and then it's followed up by the high school research program. Again, a favorite program of mine, uh, and there's some logistics to that. I just wanna let you know that it's, it's a six week program that we have a Brookhaven lab uh, for high school students. Um, and then um, the students, is a, the program serves as a collaboration between the students and the BNL STEM professional, and it serves an introduction to the, the Department of Energy mission. And um, it exposes the students to the research environment at a national laboratory. And it provides as um, it is, uh, it serves as a, as a jumping ground or, or a stepping uh, tool to the Department of Energy college internship program. Um, so it is, it, is, it is a great introduction to what our environmental research life is. I just wanna share two pictures that I have here. This is um, one of the students um, back in 2019. This is Kathy Cow. She was from Comac High School. And she was, she had one of the, uh, the advantages of the program is that the students get to present their findings to the peers and scientific community. So she or she or she's presenting her work, her, her collaboration at that time. And she was using machine learning to uh, understand, to accurately predict how rain, uh, uh, how much rain will precipitate or will come down, will precipitate from a hurricane. So it's addressing, you know, the storms are getting, hurricanes are getting stronger. Uh, they have more, they're getting stronger, more wind and more uh, rain uh, goes along. So she's looking at those, um, at finding models to better understand how to address uh, the impact of those storms. Um, and then in this figure right here, I wanted to show this one because this is a recent one. I earlier spoke about the Tracer project. So this is a, a blog that the students, uh, this summer students put together for the, for the ARM Department of Energy blog page. And I'm sort of showcasing that is because uh, I like the, the, the collaboration between our high school students and our participants of the Department of Energy college internship. So I have here uh, Amanda Takonaski. She was a high school student from Longwood here in Long Island. And she is um, collaborating in the, in, a, in the Tracer project with uh, college students that are participating in the, DO, in the, in the DOE college internship. Again, it, it shows um, how these programs um, are provide, how the high school research program provides a pathway uh, for students into this uh, DOE mentorships and also allow, provides the students the ability to create mentorship and build relationships uh, that last for, 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 for a lifetime. Okay, so I have spoken to you about uh, the programs that we run at the office. What I wanna shift right now is to two programs that our office supports in collaboration with external partners. Um, and the first one that I wanna touch on is the Open State Program, the Day of the Life of the River. Uh, this program uh, runs in the in collaboration with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Central Pine Balance Commission. Okay? And so this is a place-based uh, uh, outdoor educational program. The students and their teachers go to various rivers and estuaries around Long Island, and they go to assess the environmental state of those rivers. Um, and so they, they, they do that by looking at their chemistry, their biology, and the physical state of those rivers, okay? Um, they, they by doing so, it creates a, an awareness of the environmental and stewardship and of the environmental issues that's in the region. Um, the information that the students collect um, can potentially uh, inform stakeholders uh, and impact some of the decisions when it comes to environmental conversations. Um, I think for me, the cool thing about the program is that it exposes the students to professionals in the environmental field. 
And like I said, for 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 groups of people that are usually be on on that are happy on their service centers and underserved in the environmental field, this is a very important aspect of the program. Um, here I have I just want to share we, we do collaborate. So this is uh, from the USG scientists from the USG USGF. Um, you know, collecting data, water, uh, river data, chemical data from the river. And as I also mentioned, they get to do bio, bio they did make to do biodiversity and do a survey of the biodiversity of the, of the rivers. And they get to count what is missing, what, what has changed in the, in the number of case fishes that are, are present. So this is one program that we do collaborate with external, external the stakeholders. The other program that we do collaborate with external stakeholders that we had a long standing collaboration is the Bark Common Island project. Very cool one, actually. Um, this is a, collection, a collaboration that we do with um, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and so it's the Bark Common Island, um, I say that it's, 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 looking at the, it's looking at the environment through the eyes of DNA. So the, the students go and collect samples for plants, uh, samples for insects, you know, to get my ants, spiders, mosquitoes. They extract that DNA and then they take that DNA and, and create a in, in sequence and get a, a sequence to create a barcode. That sequence is the orders of those ATGCs that make up the DNA. So you, you want to think about the barcode, it's like an UPC code, you know, in the same, the can of beans that identify each pro product. So that, you, uh, that UPC code says that that bar identified that bean as a can of beans. Was well, the same deal, right? Because the DNA barcode, the DNA sequence is very unique. The pattern of that sequence is unique to each organism. So when they create that short DNA sequence pattern or that DNA barcode, they can use that to identify organisms uh, within our ecosystem. And so uh, the project is very cool and has been in, is, is in using the open space as a platform, we have been able to integrate both programs, right? The open space, the data life, the river, and the bar along island in a very synergistic way, okay? Very synergistic way. Let me give you an example of what this, you know, what the impact on a on a, on a, of, a, of a collaboration like this. So this is an ex, an example. This is a, uh, back from 2018, 2019. Um, there was a set of mosquitoes that were collected in Comfort Park. And one of those mosquitoes, they didn't know what it was. So what did they do? They went in and took the mosquito and get the DNA extracted, uh, they sequenced, and they found that the barcode of that mosquito matches this Iris fermenter. It's a very interesting name for a mosquito. Uh, if you're, I'm curious what the story is in there. Maybe Google it for some other time. But um, it, it matches the Iris fermenter. Um, and so it was the first time that this species of mosquito that normally, traditionally, is found on the south of the, Uni of the south region of the United States is, has been detected in Long Island. And it has been seen ever since then. So this is a, an ex, it, 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 it has been seen ever ever since. So it, the Barco project, in collaboration with Open Space and other programs, allows students it allows us to kind of assess the impact of how climate change had had into the distribution of various, uh, you know, uh, in this case, mosquitoes in, in the distribution of organisms. Okay, distribution of organisms. In the case of the mosquito, it has a health implications too, because mosquitoes, as you know, carry pathogens. They can carry, some of them can carry pathogens such as the West Nile virus, equine cephalitis, dengue, and so forth. So um, it, it, it allows us, it gives a glimpse of, of the impact of changes in the climate into the uh, diversity, biodiversity in, in the region. So, um, so I'm going to, Switch for a bit, and so, uh, so we have talked about external collaborations. So I'd like to kind of shift and 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 shift to Lisa, and she will be start talking about. She will start the discussion 
about internal collaborations as we, Office of Educational Problems, collaborate with the National Synchrotron Life Source too. Um, and it will also would serve as an introduction to, as an introduction to the spark problem, which I will address at, uh, later on. Lisa, the slides are yours. All right, thank you very much, Aleda. Let me see if I can get it to change for me. Okay, great. So um, as Aleda indicated in the very beginning, Brookhaven National Laboratory is a large campus of um, buildings, but it's also something very special about it, um, as is true with the other national labs, is that um, the Department of Energy National Labs are, have a number of what we call national user facilities. Um, and I have labeled some of them on this uh, slide here, but the one I'm gonna focus um, on today is the department where I work, which is called the National Synchrotron Light Source Number Two. And of course, I don't expect you to know what that means, but I'll get to that in just a minute. But the, um, the point I would like to make from this slide is that these national user facilities um, that are at the DOE labs are built for um, science for scientists all around the world to come and use. And so these are facilities that um, cost hundreds of millions to even a billion or more dollars to build. But then there we open the doors for um, scientists from academia, from national labs, from industry, from high schools, um, et cetera, all to come and use the instrumentation and facilities that we have um, to do their experiments. And that's at no charge to them. It's all done by a peer review proposal process. So um, I am gonna talk about, uh, so I am a scientist at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about what this uh, synchrotron is. All right, so the um, uh, NSLS2 is basically a very ultra bright X-ray microscope. And so this is a very large machine. So you can actually fit all of Yankee Stadium into the center of it. So you, you really can't get a perspective from a photograph, but if you do fly over Long Island, um, coming into any of the New York airports and you fly over Brookhaven Lab, you'll easily see uh, the National Synchrotron Light Source 2. Um, so even though we are a very big machine, what we do is we produce very, very tiny X-rays and also infrared light for doing experiments. Uh, and I'll just briefly with this video show you how that works. Um, so we actually use electrons to produce these X-rays and um, the electrons start with an electron gun and um, you'll see that in a red dot in here just a second. The electrons get accelerated into a by a linear accelerator into what we call a booster ring. And then once those electrons get up to about the speed of light, we store them in what we call a storage ring or the synchrotron ring. So that's where the word synchrotron comes from. And these electrons spin around in this circular orbit. And as they turn, they give off energy. And the energy that they give off is in the form of light. And specifically, the light is very bright X-rays or um, infrared light. And what we have on this synchrotron ring, all these lines that you see that are drawn kind of tangent to this circle are what we call beam lines, where we collect these beams of light, like you can see in the white here. We collect those beams of light to do experiments. So so sitting at the end of every single beam line is a team of scientists that's collecting those very, very tiny beams of x-rays uh, and they're shining them on their sample in order to learn all about the chemistry or the structure of their samples. Um, and the samples can range anywhere from biological samples to environmental samples to physics um, to engineering, etc. Uh, and every and and so all of these experiments can all be running at the same time. So as many beam lines as you have on a synchrotron, um, you can run that many experiments. So just a little bit more about NSLS2 and the uh, involvement in um, um, training and education for the users that do come to the facility. So we have right now 28 beam lines that are open. Um, NSLS2 opened in 2015, so it's a very young facility, although um, NSLS1 was at Brookhaven National Laboratory for 30 years and it shut down just the year before and we built this beautiful new machine. We have 28 beam lines now, but we have space for 60 of them. So that means 28 teams of scientists can be running their experiments all at the same time um, and running all different kinds of experiments all at once. So because of that, we have upwards of 2000 different scientists, which we call users, that come to the facility to do experiments every single year. 
Um, and this, uh, since the pandemic, we've actually learned quite well how to run experiments actually remotely, where our staff are actually on site at the beam lines, and they work remotely with scientists to help them do their experiments. So we have been able to keep experiments running um, through the pandemic, and we've run over 800 experiments in this past year, even though they've been done um, remotely. Uh, as I mentioned, this beam time, so if you if you get time, you, you basically will write a proposal to get beam time on the synchrotron to do experiments. So if you have a great idea, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from if you write this scientific proposal um, and it gets peer reviewed by a team of scientists, it gets a score and the best scored proposals are awarded beam time. There's no charge for that beam time. What you get is, is time to come and use the instrumentation and you get friendly scientists um, at the facility that will help you do those experiments. Um, and, and as I said, there is no charge for that beam time uh, unless it's proprietary work. So we do have some industry that comes to the facility um, who, who uh, will, will pay for a full cost recovery beam time for their experiments. Now, um, the synchrotron is, is a very specialized machine, but since there are so many different areas that scientists that um, could use it from, um, we have a lot of training courses that we do and um, a lot of programs. And, and as Alita mentioned, all the way back you know, to her, the, the STEM prep group, her high school students, um, but we also have undergraduate, um, graduate students, PhD and master students. We have faculty that come and learn. Um, and, and a number of other um, groups that will be engaged in, work in working and learning at Brookhaven Lab. Um, so we have annual uh, courses to teach them all about different synchrotron techniques. We do those online and we also kind of have a traveling um, course that we do. Uh, we do a Synchrotrons 101. So if you wanna learn about it, we do that once a year. Uh, one thing that uh, Aleda mentioned very briefly is that the Department of Energy has um, programs for undergraduates where they actually get a paid summer internship, and we get a number of them that will come to Brookhaven Lab and specifically to NSLS2 also to do their summer internships uh, with scientists at Brookhaven. We have a similar, DOE has a similar program for visiting faculty, uh, and NSLS2 also has a postdoc and PhD program. So we really try to promote this um, pipeline of students all the way from middle school um, through their PhD so that they can either um, be users of the facility in their scientific research in the future, or just learn about it, understand how it works, or also become new staff at the facility as well. Um, and I and Aleda already mentioned the high school research program and the STEM prep program, and she will describe the SPARK program, which is which is a collaboration between Office of Educational Programs and NSLS2, where students actually get the opportunity to write one of these proposals, and um, their proposal gets scored, and they bring, they come to Brookhaven Lab to NSLS2 to do experiments. So what I would like to do now is just describe um, some of the types of things in the environmental sciences arena that can be done with this bright x-ray machine at Brookhaven. So let me introduce to you um, a, a little bright yellow plant called Alyssa morale. It's actually a, um, uh, can be considered an invasive weed in parts of California, um, but it actually has some very unique properties. So if I take a, if I zoom in on this field of, of yellow, um, and, and look closer at the plant. Um, yes, there are yellow flowers, but there are also green leaves. Uh, and these green leaves are very special because they have been known to um, perform a process which we call phyto remediation. And so phyto is basically for plant and remediation is basically uh, meaning to clean something up. And so what these plants can actually do is remove heavy metals from contaminated soils. Uh, and incidentally, what's very nice about these plants is they can remove heavy metals from the contaminated soils, but then you can take the plant and you can actually recover those heavy metals for um, useful purposes later. Now, how does the synchrotron play a role in phytoremediation? Well, if I were to take one of the leaves from this Alyssa morale plant and I were um, to just take a regular x-ray of it with your typical dentist x-ray or your doctor's x-ray, uh, it's going to look like this. It will be a black and white image where the more dense things in this case are dark and the more um, uh, less dense things are bright. This is interesting, but what's more interesting is what we really want to know is about the chemistry of this plant leaf. And we want to understand how these heavy metals are being taken up by the soil. So if I take a picture with the synchrotron x-ray microscope, it will look like this. 
where we, I can actually see the elemental distribution of all the different elements within this leaf. So we see potassium, which we know should be in a leaf. We see calcium in green, which we know should be in a leaf. But interestingly, what we also see in this particular leaf up here at the top is in red, and that's actually cobalt, which is a heavy metal that should not be in your soil. Um, but it is shown by these studies by Ryan Tapero uh, that you can that the Alyssa morale plant will actually sequester cobalt into its leaves and take it out of the soil for remediating that soil. And as scientists, the next thing we want to know is how does this actually happen? And so this is another way, this is a way that the synchrotron actually plays a role in understanding the actual science. So we have this picture that shows us that cobalt is being brought into the soil, but how does that actually happen? So this is another example from Ryan's group where he's looking at a different type of um, plant, but he's looking at the actual seed of the plant. And this particular, so this is a very, this is a, a seed that's a couple millimeters in size. Um, and if he were to take an x-ray image of it, you can see that this seed has taken up nickel from the soil. So it's another hyperaccumulator. And one might ask, well, how in the world can this seed actually germinate and survive if it has all of this nickel? And if you take just a two-dimensional image of this picture of the seed, that it's just going to look like it's loaded with nickel. But if you actually, what we can do is a CT scan where we can get the nickel distribution in three dimensions. And so um, just like you can have a CT scan at the doctor of, of an organ, we can do a CT scan with the x-ray microscope of the seed, but we get the elemental distribution and then we can virtually cut the seed like where this line is. And this is the type of picture you're going to get. So again, you're going to see the different elements, but the green is the nickel. And what we see now from this, this CT scan, which is much more higher resolution, is that the nickel is actually sequestered into these cells, into the cell wall of the seed. And so that's how this plant is actually able to survive and continue to germinate because it pushes this nickel to a place where it's not going to get in the way of the cellular um, uh, growth process. And so it's with the synchrotron and the ability to actually focus in, we can get all the way down to a few microns uh, or submicron, which is incidentally a hair is about 100 microns. And so much smaller than the size of a human hair, we're taking these very tiny x-ray beams and we can get this nickel concentration. At, at very, very high resolution to help us understand how these plants are able to do that. And then you could go back and um, improve the process. And if I move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about improving the process. So um, this is not a phytoremediation example. This is actually something different. We're still looking at the elemental distribution of plants, but this is work done by Ryan Tapiro and Tracy Punchin from Dartmouth um, College, where they've actually been genetically modifying plants to make to um, deliver more calcium and more specifically bioavailable calcium. So if you take this particular plant, uh, if you take a particular leaf, you're gonna see that there is calcium in the leaf and there's more in the veins than elsewhere. Um, but what they have actually, and, and but what they've shown is that if you zoom in on one of these leaves, so if I zoom in on this particular area here, the calcium actually gets stored in the leaf as something called calcium oxalate, and that is not bioavailable. So if you were to eat this leaf, to try and get a um, calcium supplementation, that calcium is not going to be bioavailable to, your, to the human. However, they've genetically modified this plant, and so they've actually um, changed the distribution of calcium. So they've prevented this, uh, so they've gotten rid of the sequestration of the calcium as calcium oxalate, and they produce a different type of calcium, which is actually more bio, 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 bioavailable. So this plant is actually a, um, a source of calcium. Um, in you know for the diet that would be uh, um, uh, good for a calcium supplement. So this is this is another example of how the X-ray microscope is used to understand the um, plants in the environment and how they can be both detrimental and beneficial to the to the um, um, to the uh, population. And lastly, I'd like to um, provide one more example, and that's a project that has been done by Aaron Garland, Science Research Group. Uh, Aaron is a science research teacher at Bayshore High School on Long Island, and her students are part of the SPARC program, which we'll, later, we'll describe in a second, and they are very interested in microplastics in the environment. So um, we know that all of the uh, extra plastic materials are, are getting into our oceans. They're partially breaking down, breaking down, but we're getting a lot of tiny pieces of plastic um, that are not um, breaking down and they're being 
sent through the air, through the water, et cetera, into our wildlife, into, for example, clams on Long Island. So Aaron's group has looked at clams and they've actually, uh, what, what you can do is if you take the, um, the, the meat of the clam, you can actually take a look. If you zoom in with just a regular light microscope and you see what's in that meat, you see little pieces of clam, that's fine, but you also see these fibers, things like this um, and things like this. Those are not supposed to be there. Um, they're not part of the clam. They're not biological. They're actually microplastics that the clam has ingested um, during its normal filtration of water in and out of the clam. And so what Aaron's group wanted to know is what are these microplastics? Because if we can understand which ones are getting into the environment and contaminating these clams, then we can either work to remove them from, this, from the environment before that happens or transition them into different plastics um, in, order to, uh, in order to remove them too. So they've done, um, if, 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 the, if you take a look at one of these very fine, fine um, fibers, we can take our, in this case, an infrared beam, which is only this big compared to this tiny little fiber that you see. It's a very tiny beam. We can shine on it. And then we can, what we do is something we get, we get what's called a spectrum, which is basically a footprint of what is, what this fiber is made out of. And it turns out that um, um, this fiber, which is the blue curve that you see here, is actually um, a combination based on looking at just a, a database of different infrared spectra. It's a combination of cellophane and um, silicon caulk. And so we have now, we've been able to now find that these tiny little fibers inside the clam are, are bringing in cellophane and silicon, um, and silicon caulk, which is basically just a glue. Um, that, that got into this clam because it wasn't, it wasn't broken down and it got into the environment. So those are just a few examples of some of the environmental science research that gets done um, at the National Synchrotron Light Source. And in all of these cases, we have um, students all the way from, from high school uh, interns all the way up through um, graduate students, PhD faculty. Uh, and, we're, and, and the message I'd like to send is that this facility is open to anyone that has a great idea that wants to use it. We are scientists at a facility that know how to use this instrumentation and help folks do experiments. And so um, any science that, uh, that, that any group science that wants to be done, we're here to, uh, to welcome you um, to our facility. And with that, I'll hand it back to Aleda to, to um, follow up on Spark. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So I'm going to introduce Spark. Um, uh, Spark, as, as, our, as, as Lisa mentioned in her slide, is Student Partnership for Advanced Research and Knowledge. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a program here that we have at Brookhaven Lab. Um, I just want to give you a sense of this map here, just to give you a sense of the schools that have participated in the program uh, throughout the past couple of years. Um, so we have a, a numbers of schools in the Long, in Long Island region, a school in the city, and this, and this most recently, we just had a school from uh, Tennessee uh, join the program. Um, the, the SPARC program um, enables students and their science educators to uh, access the Brookhaven lab facilities. So you have where HSRP is um, a very defined timeline. You know, you have, we have six weeks. The SPARC provides a long-term, uh, uh, provides opportunity, opportunity for students to explore long-term projects uh, with uh, possible long-term access to a specific facility. It is driven by the research interests of the students and, and teachers. Um, it's a collaborative program. So the students and teachers collaborate from various school districts and schools collaborate, collaborate with each other, um, you know, based on their common in, shared common interests. Um, but also SPARC participants um, collaborate are uh, mentor by uh, BNL scientific community, receptive community. As Lisa mentioned, access to it is through a, a proposal process, which gets evaluated like any other user uh, proposal is, and then um, and then if, if if deem allocation time may be given, okay. Um, and it's another way for the development. Again, it's, it's, it's a pathway to continue the development of the next generation of STEM professionals, and it's inclusive and diverse working working form. I just want to share a couple of images here of a student. Um, you know, at the light source here, they are uh, students at one of our beam lines with Paul Northrum, one of our 
scientific mentors and advisors uh, collecting information. Again, with one of scientific mentors, Dan, uh, Daniel Old, putting uh, their sample, all their, their samples into the uh, beam, into the uh, beamline area to collect information. This is our, uh, our mentor, Tiffany Victor, again, collecting, putting samples into the infrared. So it's a community uh, of scientists and students. Um, these are share the project with, uh, that Erin has been doing. I wanna share a little, a, a different project with you. And this project has to do with an environmental con concern question that the students have near their school. So this, this particular project was initiated by William Floyd High School. And this school is right here in this, dot if you can see that in here in Long Island. And as you can see near the school, they have a, the Forge River uh, uh, runs through, okay? And so because of, of the platform for the Day of the Life of the River program, uh, the students were able to uh, be part of the Day of the Life and collect various samples data throughout the river, okay? Throughout the river, okay? And um, the Forest River is interesting because unlike the other rivers nearby, the Forest River has been disproportionately impacted by human activity. Um, it, is, it's, it has been known that it has a, it has a polluted river. Uh, you can find certain pollutions there due to pesticides, sewage, drainage, dock farms, and so on. So what the students wanted to know was what is the impact of that of the pollution that is known in the river in the ecosystem that depends on it. So looking at how it goes perhaps throughout or up to the food chain. So in order to do that, the students use spiders as those biomarkers. Okay, biomarkers. So I said they collected samples from various areas of the river. And they went on to the x-ray to ask the question, what is, what is in the spiders? So just have an image of the spiders that, that, that they, were, they looked at. They didn't look at the whole spider. They just took a piece of it, which is right here, is the chelicerae. I will call it the mouth of the spider. And this is just an image of what the samples look like uh, as they are mounted for analysis. This is, again, the spider, and it's at the soil sample. And when the students put the samples in front, in, in front of the x-ray, in, uh, in front of the x-ray, they get information about the elemental composition of that, you know, the uh, of elemental composition of the soil and the spider. It's like a footprint, right? As Lisa mentioned, what is in those samples? Uh, you know, you can see iron, which is very, it's a nutrient of soil. So it's expected to see that element in higher numbers in the samples, but they also are seeing all the elements as well, um, as well um, in the spider in relation to the soil samples. Uh, the data uh, is preliminary because of COVID, um, there was a, a, a delay in continued analysis of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the samples that the students collected. However, uh, the students had the opportunity to present their preliminary data to um, former state senator, New York State Senator Monica Martinez, because her, her jurisdiction at uh, the district falls, William Floyd, which is the high school, falls within that district. Uh, so it was a very exciting moment for the students to be able to share uh, what they, uh, their initial observation, and that's, I think, it's one of the uh, very um, motivators and one of the, one of the things that the student gains by participating in programs like this, be able to communicate the findings to, um, to a stakeholder. Um, I just, uh, looking at time, I don't wanna go through all the, the projects in this slide here. I just wanted to let you know that we do have additional uh, projects uh, in the climate and science involvement of students in various projects related to climate science and, and, and environmental issues, either through the SPARC program and, or the high school research program applicated lab. Like I said, I'm not gonna go through all the lists of them, but I do wanna point out this project because I think it's a very cool project. One of the projects that we have started to look um, in the SPARC program is oysters. Uh, it's just oyster shells that we have a collaboration with the Cornell Cooperative, which are looking at oysters from the 1600, 1800, and all the way to uh, modern times. And if you 
in, in oysters, like a tree, each layer that there, you cut the shell, um, you know, long it in, you cut the shell, you can see the layers of that, of that oyster shell and it tells you a story, right? So your story about what happened at that particular time in that environment where the shell was uh, found. And so the students are trying to, um, we have very little information to start with. So what the first thing we do, we did when we put it into the x-ray was, do we see any differences in this, in this different time period shell? And again, this is just a story that we just started collecting data this early this year. But um, you said that there's layers of the, of the oyster shell and we see a little bit of, uh, 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 we see a, a difference between uh, a little bit of, of phosphorus in the, in the oyster 1600, but not in the modern shell. Uh, we yet don't know, yet understand the diffusion and behind it could be apoxia, as we believe, or there might be some salinity differences in them. Nonetheless, we have collected more samples uh, from the Cornell Cooperative, and we are moving forward to do a larger sample to get uh, a bigger, a, a, a greater picture of what might be going on in, in, in these oysters from different periods of time. But the bottom line is that it uh, uh, provides students with a window to understand environment, how the environment had changed throughout time. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, this is um, a list of our programs. Uh, you know, this is the, if any information you can look at the Office of Educational Program. This is our major website uh, that you can find information about the various programs that we described today. And if you want to become a, a user of the life course, you know, feel free to check out the, the webpage or contact Lisa. She will get back to you right away. Uh, these are contact information. When I talk to us, feel free to reach out by email anytime. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much. That was just absolutely fantastic. I am I have to admit, while you were both presenting, I was feeling slightly resentful because when I was in school, when I was a high school student in the Bronx, I never had these types of opportunities to visit Brookhaven or I didn't have science teachers who mm -hmm. were really taking an applied approach. So yeah, I really just wanna commend you both. And I know you have a very large team at Brookhaven, but I really think it's fantastic. And I, I love the fact that, you, you know, Aleda, you said that window, right? Into sort of being able to see environmental changes for them to, you know, for young people to come to understand, you know, what are the what are the human impacts on our um, on our environment, right? On their ecosystems that are, you know, in their in their neighborhoods, right, close to where they live. So, um, really, just absolutely fantastic. And um, at least I have to say, when you were presenting on uh, your work, just. I mean, I do minerals partially part because I, I do energy and environment stuff, but more in terms of minerals that go into sort of energy technologies. And the fact that you're finding cobalt and you're finding these kinds of things embedded in plants is just, it blows my mind. So it really is just so super, super interesting. Um, I have a cut. I want to make sure that our audience, anyone that has a question, should uh, jump in. And I also want to do because I see that um, we have a special guest who's uh, who's joined. I want to introduce everyone to um, to David Manning, who's the director of stakeholder relations at the Brookhaven National Lab, um, a dear friend. Um, I think the world of all the work that's happening at Brookhaven. And I really do want to emphasize that it is an absolute treasure for New York. And I know on regular years, you have about 30,000 people and groups who, who visit. So the fact that you also make it a space for citizen science and education, I think is just tremendous. So I do hope if there are teachers who are who are participating today, who are listening, you know, students who want to get involved, that this is, you know, this is this is something that's, you know, a drive away <laughs> to take advantage. And um, I know those educators that are located on Long Island 
um, you're already working very, very closely with them. But David, I wanted to thank you because you've helped to sort of bring us NYU and Brookhaven National Lab together. And I just also wanna tell a very quick story is many years ago, probably not many years ago, um, but about six years ago, I did have the opportunity to bring a group of uh, NYU students to Brookhaven. And most of those students were students who were doing energy and environmental policy. And it totally provided them with a new lens for thinking about what they were studying. So, you know, to see policy, but to kind of go back to see the different, the science and the, um, and the incredible work that's being done, that's, that's helping to support the energy transition and helping, helping us to better understand um, the impacts of climate change on ecosystems, on our environment and how to how to connect that with policy. So David, thank you very much. Do you wanna say a few words? Uh, just, well, as you heard today, and of course I'm not gonna in any way um, contradict my two buddies here, but um, we're very proud of the work that we've been able to do in the whole workforce development side. I mean, this is, a, this is an amazing place. It is an absolutely amazing place. 5,000 acres hidden in the woods uh, out on Long Island, but, but it's also one of the real national treasures and it's wonderfully accessible uh, at the moment virtually, but that will change. Uh, it's wonderfully accessible uh, to students and it's a high, high priority for the laboratory. Uh, and the demographics of labs, you know, Phil, are, are, are fascinating. I mean, there's a lot more people here that look a lot like me <laughs> than, than we should. And so there's just huge opportunity going forward. So the opportunity that we have to connect with, with you, uh, with your students, with institutions like yours, um, is just uh, is, is special. It's very important. And that's why uh, we get full support from people like Elena and, and from Lisa. So, and behind the two of them are just a whole uh, raft of mentors who really love this work. And that I think is, is I, I would say this on behalf of both of you and all your colleagues, I'm constant, as a non-scientist here, I'm constantly impressed by the commitment of, of, of the real scientists, including these two and all the mentors behind them. So thank you both and thank you, Carol. And this is always a treat to work with you. Well, thank you. And I, yeah, and I just wanna, you know, commend Dr. Perez and Dr. Miller because I, you know, in my intro, I, I really emphasize their background and, you know, their extraordinary educational background. And the fact that, you know, they're really sort of, they're taking their research and they're sharing it and they're inviting young people in. And I love the idea of sort of thinking about pathways so that um, you know, people that are you know young people that are high school students, um, sort of the pre-college area, the college area, who can really be thinking about you know careers in science, both as from as researchers, as scientists, but also how they how they can think about applying science to um, to their work. So so much. I mean, I have a ton of questions about the microplastics and, and clams and sort of, you know, identifying those and then sort of how we find ways to eliminate. I have a student who's working on a, in a bioplastics company right now because plastics is such a, um, you know, a conundrum, right? In terms of for thinking about um, environmental justice and, and, and climate related issues. Um, but I love just, just everything that you're doing. So I really want to thank you so much for taking the time today to share your, um, to share your work, to share all the collaborations that you're doing, you know, outside of the lab, right? Outside of Brookhaven National Lab. And we are really excited at NYU to, um, you know, to be working with you and to connect what we're doing at the Energy, Climate Justice and Sustainability Lab to highlight what is happening across Brookhaven and to, you know, really to bring, bring to, you know, our community, um, the connection between, um, you know, environmental justice and just, for example, these projects that you, you shared today and how when you bring young people um, and you let them explore and discover, and then they can, you know, better understand the impacts, the human impacts um, that are ongoing around them. So um, yeah, very excited to, um, to do more events and to share more of the uh, really significant 
and groundbreaking work that is um, that is happening. Again, we're we're still in the midst of Climate Week, but Climate Week doesn't end. Climate Week is uh, Climate Day. Every day is Climate Day. So. Um, but thank, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Many thanks to Dr. Miller and Dr. Perez. Uh, David, always grateful to have opportunities to work with you and to everyone at Brookhaven. I really do appreciate all the, um, all the tremendous work that you're doing. So thank you.